at this Arthur, this Arthur Moffin story that I passed out, right? And I left a few questions on the board for you um, to try to answer on your own at home. So I don't really want to belabor this too much because I'd rather uh, get to talking about the Raymond Carver story. Um, but I just want to see how far you got with this. Um, now I gave you a couple of quick definitions at the end of class last time. Um, does anybody remember what the difference was between a story of incident and a story of character? A story of incident about an event. Yes. The primary concern of a story of incident is an event. Story of character is about the character's development? Yes. Exactly. Very good. The story of character is primarily concerned with revealing to you the psychology or personality of a particular character. Um, so, the soldier's rest. Where would you place this? Would you say this is, a, this is a story of incident or a story of character, and why? Yeah, Tola. I'll see this as a story of character because okay. it really explains to us, um, as far as I read it, it talked to us about how he got his injury, about how he was in the war, all that okay. happened throughout, making him the person he is, all mm -hmm. the events that took place that made him into the man he is and where he is right now. Okay. And this actually also just sort of begs the interesting question of where he is exactly, right? That's one of the questions the story asks, right? This guy, you know, he's fighting in France, and then he wakes up, and he's in this familiar but unfamiliar place, right? Uh, how many of you agree with Tola that this is a story of character? Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, most of you. Right, so do you... Do you agree with Tola's reasoning as to why this is a story of character? Some of you are hemming and hawing a little bit. Do you have other reasons for thinking this is a story of character? If you do, please go ahead and share. Okay, um, how many of you think that this is, in fact, a story of incident, that it's really more about an event than it is about a character. Demarcus, why do you think this is a story of incident? Okay. It is surrounding a little bit about his, how he got it in the middle. Mm -hmm. And but at the same time, it's also developing his character. And uh -huh. he's really out of place where he did. Yeah, where, where do you think he is? Um, the hospital? Well, it's <laughs> okay. You think it's a mental hospital? Okay, let's try some other possibilities here, right? We'll go, we'll come back to this in a minute. Mental hospital. Where else do Where else do you think he might be? Yeah, uh, I think he's Daisha. In heaven. You think he's in heaven? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other possibilities, Frank. If not in heaven, then in limbo. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it could be in a coma. Right, this could be taking place. So essentially, where he might be is in his own head. Imagination land. Okay. What does the place he's in look like? It's clean. Pardon? It's a cathedral. Um, mm. states it looks like a cathedral back in Wales. Okay, well, it looks like a cathedral town back in Wales, right? The actual room where he's in, right? If you look on the first page here, the wounded soldier was somewhat of this disposition as he opened his eyes, pulled himself together, and looked about him. He felt a sense of delicious ease and repose in bones that had been racked and weary. And deep in the heart that had so lately been tormented, there was an assurance of comfort, of the battle won, 
The thundering, roaring waves were past. He had entered into the haven of calm waters. After fatigues and terrors that as yet he could not recollect, he seemed now to be resting in the easiest of all easy chairs in a dim, low room. In the hearth there was a glint of fire and a blue, sweet-scented puff of wood smoke. A great black oak beam roughly hewn across the ceiling. Through the leaded panes of the windows, he saw a rich glow of sunlight, green lawns, and against the deepest and most radiant of all blue skies, the wonderful far-lifted towers of the vast Gothic cathedral, mystic, rich with imagery. So he's in a comfortable room with a roaring fire, wooden beams across the ceiling, leaded panes on the windows. He can see a cathedral through the windows, right? And it looks like a place he knows. There's a good, this is just like Wells, right? This is just like this little Welsh town that I come from. If this was an inn, they ought to call it the soldier's rest. So he's in a place that looks like a rural, like an English country inn, right? Now, what makes you think, Tola, that this is a mental, that he's in a mental hospital? Uh, is this thing with the, I felt like it was the same with him dreaming at all, like it was all in his head and they're just keeping him somewhere to rest. Okay, that essentially that the head wound suggests to you addled brains. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, if we think about the context of the story as well, right? When was this written? What was going on when the story was written? Yeah, First World War, right? This guy is a so he is an English soldier in the First World War. So traumatic stress of various kinds, like what we would now call PTSD what was then called shell shock was quite common. And there were a lot of guys who would have to spend, you know, several weeks back at home in hospital uh, getting their heads together, only then to be put right back out um, on the front once they were judged okay. But yeah, so this guy could be shell shocked and could be in a mental hospital. There are certain, certainly some things about the scene that seem off, right? What suggests an imaginary or not quite earthly setting for this? Apart from the fact that the guy's suffering from a head wound. Okay, yeah, this guy in the black cloak appears out of nowhere. Good. What else is weird about this place? It's, yeah, way too peaceful, right? Does he have any idea how he got here? No idea how he got here. Right, one minute he's in France. Yeah, he wakes up, he's in some place else entirely, right? Anything else that suggests something off or unearthly about the setting? Yeah, Gabby, is that a hand up? Yeah, the only other people here are these men in black, right? And there's more than one man in black. There's only one that shows up at the beginning, right? The guy who's talking to him throughout, but then more and more start appearing. He's the only one there who's not one of these black cloaked gentlemen. Now, one would think that if he was, say, in a hospital, there would be other, you know, there would be other soldiers there being treated, right? Unless he is, of course, caught up in his own head. Now, Daisha, you thought that he was dead and in heaven. Why do you think that? Because it said new wine of the kingdom. Okay. And the place they used to have was in school. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, so the <clears throat> the soldier's rest is the name he gives to the little imaginary inn that he's in, right? But it does also indicate, like, you know, rest after struggle, right? Good. Rest after struggle, new wine of the kingdom. Yeah. 
Yeah, what is it? What's going on with these guys? With, with these guys giving him this drink? Do you think? They don't want me to let come in. Okay. okay. What were you? What were you saying, Darius? Welcome, maybe. Okay, kind of welcome. Yeah, they seem to be in, inducting him into some kind of fellowship, right? I mean, you know, we call the ceremony of communion communion because it is about including yourself in a community, right? Ultimately, that's the purpose of the ritual. At the beginning of the ritual, you're just some individual who showed up at church. At the end of the ritual, you're part of a community that has shared this ritual meal, right? So, yeah, he's being made a part of this new community. Who do you think these guys are, these ministers in the black robes? Does the story give us any clues as to who or what we're supposed to think these people are? Um, they're wearing armor under the robes, and he said it was made of starlight. Yeah, armor made of starlight under the robes. And his sword was made of fire. Sword, sword of flame. Sword of flame, yeah. Now, what sorts of figures wear armor of starlight and carry swords of flame. And archangel. Yeah. This is imagery that's often associated with angels. In fact, if we look at the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the note to the little bit of poetry here, the full in the midst is cross of red, triumphant Michael brandished and trampled the apostate's bride, right? Michael the Archangel, right, of course. This comes from a line, uh, lines of a poem by Sir Walter Scott that are found in a stained glass window in a church in Scotland. So we are meant to draw some sort of religious inference from this, right? What else do we notice about the black-robed ministers? Um, do they all speak the same language? No, some of them are speaking French. Yeah, they only speak English and French. Why only English and French? That's what you can understand. Well, on the one, yeah, okay, that's probably what this guy, yeah, this guy does speak a little bit of French. Although we see, as he's giving us a sample of his learning, that his French is not very good, right? It's pretty rudimentary. Yeah, Frank. Um, it was written while World War I was still happening. Sure. We don't want any German angels. Yeah, and in fact, if you want to talk about binaries, right, that seems to be the primary opposition the story sets up, right? Is between the nobility of the English soldier, right, you know, fighting to save his comrades, and the brutality of the German soldier, you know, essentially knifing a child in the throat, right? Yeah. So, I think that's part, yeah, part of it is this sort of wartime context, right? This World War I context. The French are allies, they're on our side. The German are enemies, they're on, the Germans are enemies, they're on the other side. So, this heavenly brotherhood is only going to be made up of English and French speakers. But there could be another resonance to this as well. Now, what else does this cup given him to, you know, given to him by this uh, group of men in starlight armor uh, kind of resemble? If we think... Blood. Pardon? Like blood, maybe? Well, the cup itself. Oh, the cup. Oh, holy grail? Yeah. yeah. Similar to the, yeah, the, the, the idea of the Holy Grail in the Arthurian legends, right? The thing that knights go questing after. You know, the cup of the Last Supper and all that shit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this looks like the cup of a carpenter. You know, thank you, Harrison Ford. So, there is a trace here of Arthurian myth as well. So these guys might not be angels. They might be dead knights, other dead warriors. 
inducting him into a fellowship, right? And why, if we think about English history in particular, why might some of these dead warriors, this brotherhood of dead British heroes, be speaking French? The French and the British always fought each other for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Um, the 100 Years War, which was a series of wars sure. that lasted 100 years. Mm -hmm. But then they wouldn't be hanging out together, right? Well, does, does anybody know what happened in England in the year 1066 that changed the way we speak? Um, the Norman Invasion. Yeah, Battle of Hastings, Norman Invasion. The Normans... came from northern France. And they defeated a native English army. So the leader of the Normans, a guy who at the time was called Duke William the Bastard, conquers England and then gets to call himself William the Conqueror for the rest of his life, which is a much more flattering title. Now what this meant is that the British knighthood, the British aristocracy in the Middle Ages, mostly spoke French we can still see traces of this in our own language. This is just sort of a brief digression, but it will actually be useful for thinking about things that we're doing later on. Um, I'm going to give you two lists of words here, and you tell me here how they're related. How are these words related to each other? Just trying to do the same thing. Just... Okay, what's the difference between these two lists? One is an animal, the other is a um, food. Okay, yep, on the one hand we've got the animal word, and on the other side here we've got the food word. All of the animal names are drawn from Anglo-Saxon, that is from Old English. All of the food names are drawn from French. Most of our cooking terms, fashion words, a lot of our legal and military terms are still drawn from French initially. Right? This is because these were the areas of life that French speakers had responsibility over. Right? So basically, your you know, dirt farming English peasant would raise the animal for the table of his French lord. That's why we call the meat by the French name and the, and the animal by the English name. So these French-speaking knights in this little fellowship probably are English knights. Right? He's being inducted into this fellowship of dead English heroes. All right, so you guys actually did a pretty good job with this. Um, again, like this is just uh, this is just something to get a little bit of practice on. Um, so, like I said, I don't really want to belabor it too much. Let's get to the Raymond Carver story, which was what we were really going to be doing for today. Um, how'd this go for you? What'd you think? <coughs> Initial impressions. I don't see a to it. Pardon? See, like a moral to the story. <clears throat> okay, um, and here's, here's the thing about uh, moral when we're reading fiction. Um, most stories aren't written to teach you any particular lesson, right? There is a particular subcategory of stories, you know, that we call sort of didactic writing. Right. If something is called didactic, that means it's meant to teach you something. Or it's meant to teach you a moral lesson, or you know, it's supposed to help you learn to count. Like, how many of you watched a, how many of you watched Sesame Street when you were kids? I think we maybe we discussed this last time a little bit, right? Okay, Sesame Street would be an example of like a didactic television program, right? It's designed to teach you things, right? It's not just sort of there to entertain you. 
most art doesn't actually work that way. Right? Certain kinds of stories are didactic. Like, for example, a fable or a parable. Right? Does anybody know what a fable is? Did any of you have, like, Aesop's fables read to you when you were a kid? Like the fox and the grapes or the tortoise and the hare? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, these are usually, like, animal stories that teach you some kind of moral lesson. Right? Like, you know, the story of the fox and the grapes. Right? He's walking along the river and he sees this bunch of grapes, and it looks good. So he jumps up and he tries to get it, and he tries all these different little strategies to try to get the grapes, and he can't reach them. So he slinks off and says, well, fuck those grapes anyway, they're probably sour. The moral being that we tend to denigrate or look down upon things that we can't have. Right, the tortoise and the hare, the whole slow and steady wins the race thing, right? So these are stories that are explicitly designed to teach you a lesson. A story like Cathedral isn't really meant to teach you any sort of lesson. That doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, ideas that it's trying to express, ideas it's trying to get across, but it's not necessarily trying to convince you of anything. Right? It's not trying to manipulate your behavior in any way. Anything else? Other sort of first impressions of this story? Yeah, Darius. It's interesting how, like, the relationship between the husband and the old man, you know, uh -huh. they turn and switch up towards the beginning and the end of the story. Yeah, there is a definite shift in the narrator's attitude towards the blind man, right? How does he feel about the blind man coming to his house at the beginning? Doesn't like him. Yeah. Does not like this idea, right? This blind man, an old friend of my wife's, he was on his way to spend the night. His wife had died. So he was visiting the dead wife's relatives in Connecticut. He called my wife from his in-laws. Arrangements were made. He would come by train, a five-hour trip, and my wife would meet him at the station. She hadn't seen him since she worked for him one summer in Seattle ten years ago. But she and the blind man had kept in touch. They made tapes and mailed them back and forth. I wasn't enthusiastic about his visit. He was no one I knew. So what does he emphasize at the beginning of this paragraph when he's first talking about the blind man? He doesn't want him. He really didn't care for him. Okay. He doesn't even know him, right? He was no one I knew. But what has he said about the blind man all before this? What aspect of the blind man's life has he been talking about before this? Or, his, or the blind man's relationship to himself? Himself meaning the narrator. There's no really, yeah, he has no relationship with the blind man. The blind man is a friend of his, wife. his wife's, yes. So he gives us all this detail about how the wife knows the blind man, right? Mm -hmm. And then tells us at the end of that, he was no one I knew. So does this seem to be part of any particular pattern in the story? If we look at the way this guy talks about his relationship with his wife. Is there something about this guy's friendship with his wife, a friendship that he's not part of, that seems like it might set him off or upset him? What's the relationship with the wife like? Pardon? Okay, the, but the narrator and the wife. <laughs> uh, maybe I should I should I should have uh, should have been more specific there. What's the narrator's relationship with his wife like? They communicate very little. Okay. What uh, What makes you say that, Ian? Why do you think they don't communicate? The only times they ever say anything to each other is very short remarks. Okay, short remarks, and do they seem to be kind or loving remarks generally? Yeah, they argue, right? Uh huh. Yeah, you'll do this for me if you love me. If you don't love me, that's fine. But do it anyway, right? So yeah, um, the guy's relationship with his wife seems to be a little bit strained, right? Now, if we continue on to the next paragraph here, right, he starts talking about 
how the wife got to know the blind man. That summer in Seattle, she had needed a job. She didn't have any money. The man she was going to marry at the end of the summer was an officer's training school. He didn't have any money either. But she was in love with the guy, and he was in love with her, etc. She'd, been seen, she'd seen something in the paper, help wanted, reading a blind man, and a telephone number. She phoned and went over, was hired on the spot. She'd worked with this blind man all summer. She read stuff to him, case studies, reports, that sort of thing. She helped him organize his little office in the county social service department. They become my, uh, good friends, my wife and the blind man. How do I know these things? She told me, and she told me something else. On her last day in the office, the blind man asked if he could touch her face. She agreed to this. She told me he touched his fingers to every part of her face, her nose, even her neck. She never forgot it. She even tried to write a poem about it. She was always trying to write a poem. She wrote a poem or two every year, usually after something really important had happened to her. So there are important things happening here at the beginning and at the end of this paragraph that tell us something about this guy's attitude, right? When he refers to his wife's ex-husband, how does he refer to him? He had no money. He didn't say his name. Yeah, he never says his name, and he, he almost never refers to this guy and he talks about him a lot, right? Mm -hmm. He almost never refers to this guy as his wife's ex-husband. He's the childhood sweetheart, the man she was going to marry, right? The man who had first enjoyed her favors, right? He jealous. often, pardon? Kind of like jealous inside. Yeah, he sounds really kind of jealous, right? Mm -hmm. He denigrates the memory of this other guy, his wife's officer by giving him mocking nicknames, by never really referring to him as having been married to the wife. And these thoughts of the ex-husband are caught up with his idea of the wife's initial meeting with the blind man, right? Mm -hmm. She was still with this guy when she met the blind man and when she and Robert stopped working together, what did Robert want to do? Touch her. Yeah, he wanted to touch her face. Now, for a blind person, this is largely just, you know, how they figure out what you look like, right? They touch your face to sort of get the contours of your features. But touching someone's face is still a really kind of intimate gesture, right? It creates a really kind of intimate connection with the person you're touching. So he thinks of his wife's being touched by Robert almost in kind of sensual, sexual terms, right? Sort of like she let this blind man violate her. And then she had to write a damn poem about it. She's always writing her damn little poems. Right. His attitude towards poetry is also a little bit jaundiced. When we first started going out together, she showed me the poem. In the poem, she recalled his fingers and the way they had moved over her face. In the poem, she talked about what she had felt at the time, about what went through her mind when the blind man touched her nose and lips. I can remember I didn't think much of the poem. Of course, I didn't tell her that. Maybe I just don't understand poetry. I admit it's not the first thing I reach for when I pick up something to read. Now, there is a telling detail in this paragraph as well, right? Does he tell her what he thinks of her poem? Does he express any opinion about her poem? He does not. When he is having a conversation with his wife, how freely does he typically express his opinions? Not, there's that one moment, right, where he's sort of joking around about taking the blind man bowling, right? But by and large, when he has a thought, he keeps it to himself. What else do we know about his relationships with other people? Yeah, he doesn't have any friends. He hates his job. 
right, his relations with everyone else in his world are strained. Right, she says she'd love it if he had friends. Please have friends. Any friend. Bring them over. It'd be great. But you have no friends. All right, so <clears throat> when Robert is at the house, how does this guy most, or how is he worried about coming off? Like when they're sitting in the living room chatting. Yeah, he's mostly quiet, lets them talk. But if you look on page 40, too, right? For the most part, I just listened. Now and then I joined in. I didn't want him to think I'd left the room, and I didn't want her to think I was feeling left out. He does feel left out, right? Yeah. But he doesn't want her to know that he feels this. He doesn't want to share this with her. It's like, hey, please include me. That would be great. What's he listening for? Oh, yeah. yeah. Say something about me. Say something about my dear husband, right? Say something about how wonderful I am. Huh? And she never does. She, he keeps waiting for her to talk about him. And she never does. So what kind of personality do we see building up over the course of this? Okay, yeah, a jealous personality. But where does that jealousy seem to stem from? Yeah, okay, yeah, um, a difficulty making connections, right, with, with other people. Yeah. And, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're the sort of person who can't even name your significant other's exes without getting upset. If you're the sort of person um, who, yeah, he's he seems to be extremely insecure, right? I mean, what kind of person would just sort of sit on the edge of his just waiting, please, please, please say my name, please include me in the conversation, right? Unless they were feeling very, very insecure. So there is like an almost, the guy puts on a tough shell, right? And particularly early in the story, he says some things that are sort of casually racist and casually sexist. But a lot of that shell is sort of, you know, covering up a wounded inside, right? That he feels cut out of his wife's life. Now, how is Robert a contrast to this? He knows, like, everything about her. Does yeah. He Robert knows everything about the wife, because they exchange these tapes. <clears throat> how else is Robert different from the narrator? He seems to be more like a people's person, like, easy to get along with. Okay. Yep. Easy going. It's like, nope, I can handle my own suitcase, right? Yeah. Sure, pour me, one, pour me one of whatever you're drinking, right? You want to smoke a joint? Sure, why not? Yeah, I've never done it before, but I'll do it. What else does that demonstrate about Robert? Yeah, that he's open-minded and willing to try new things. I mean, you know, he made it from Seattle to Connecticut to someplace in suburban New York um, all by himself in a time when airports and train terminals and that sort of thing were much less accommodating to the disabled than they are now, right? So he's clearly sort of self-sufficient. And what else do we know about his hobbies? They have a lot. Okay, lots of hobbies. And I think there's one in particular that tells us something very important about him. What has he been doing with his time recently? If we look in that same paragraph where they're talking about how the narrator feels left out and excluded. 
The blonde, pardon? Talks on that radio. Yeah, he has one of the, do, do you guys know what a ham radio is? It's like a radio, you can, it's basically um, like some other radios on its own like frequency. Yeah. Like truckers have them and they, you know, call out to each other. Or mm -hmm. each other of like you know dangers on the road. Yeah, it's it's similar to yeah, like I mean I think what you're thinking of is a CB, which is something like that you have in your car typically. It's you know you know nine or nine or well, you know one you know there's a you know crash on I ninety five that sort of thing, right? Ham radios are sort of bigger, more complex setups that you have in your house, and they have a much wider range, right? So this guy is using this home radio setup to communicate with people all over the world. Right, so you know, he's, you know, he's got friends in the Philippines and Guam and Alaska and Tahiti, right? He's talking to people everywhere. So even from his little perch in Seattle, he has a kind of international reach. So at the same time, as generally satisfied with life and happy as Robert seems to be, the narrator views him with pity. Why? He can't see. Solely because he can't see, right? feels bad for this guy solely because he can't see. Even though, like, by most accounts, we would say that Robert has a pretty good and pretty full life. Certainly a much more active and rewarding life than the narrator seems to be leading. Why is the narrator so caught up on this idea of blindness? Why does blindness bother him so much? Okay, let's sort of start from base level here with this, right? What, essentially, does blindness mean? An ability to see. Yeah, it means you can't see, right? No working visual <laughs> apparatus. <laughs> no vision. Where does he get his idea? Where does the narrator get his idea of what blindness is like? Yeah, movies and TV, right? So he gets his idea of what blindness is supposed to be like from visual media, right, from seeing blindness, right? Blindness is supposed to look a certain way. What's blindness supposed to look like to him? Dark glasses. Yep, no smiling, dark glasses. You're supposed to have a dog and a cane, right? So he imagines this whole look that goes along with blindness. Right? He's focused on the appearance of blindness. What is a blind person supposed to look like? When he talks about the blind man's relationship with his wife, with his, not with the narrator's wife, but with his own wife, what's the thing that makes him feel sympathetic? What's the thing that makes him pity Robert? Yeah. Isn't it a shame that he never saw her face, right? Isn't it a shame for both of them that he never knew what she looked like? Right, if you look on page 37, They'd married, lived and worked together, slept together, had sex, sure, and then the blind man had to bury her. 
All this without his having ever seen what the goddamn woman looked like. It was beyond my understanding. Hearing this, I felt sorry for the blind man a little bit. And then I found myself thinking what a pitiful life this woman must have led. Imagine a woman who could never see herself as she was seen in the eyes of her loved one. A woman who could go on day after day and never receive the smallest compliment from her beloved. A woman whose husband could never read the expression on her face, be it misery or something better. Someone who could wear makeup or not, what difference to him? She could, if she wanted, wear green eyeshadow around one eye, a straight pin in her nostril, yellow slacks and purple shoes, no matter. And then to slip off to, into death, the blind man's hand on her hand, his blind eye streaming tears, I'm imagining now. Her last thought may be this, that he never even knew what she looked like, and she on an express to the grave. Robert was left with a small insurance policy and half a 20 peso Mexican coin. The other half of the coin went into the box with her. Pathetic. So, even when the narrator has nice and sympathetic feelings, they're stemming from a misconception, right? If we think again about that scene that gets him so upset, thinking about Robert touching his wife's face, right? Does he understand why Robert would do that? No, he doesn't understand that Robert can get the same sorts of things he gets from looking by using his other senses. So he assumes that Robert has no idea what his wife looked like. When in fact, we see from Robert's behavior, right, the way he smokes a cigarette, the way he can tell the difference between a color and a black and white television, right, that he is able to use his other senses in ways that the narrator can't, right? The narrator relies solely on visual cues. That's his sole means of experiencing the world. So, <clears throat> what does this mean for the narrator's overall view of the world and his relationships? Pardon? Negative. Okay, they're negative, yeah. He doesn't like other people. Doesn't like this blind man coming to his house. Doesn't. He, he Pardon? Only sees what he wants to see. Yeah, it means he misses a lot of information, right? And he's aware to an extent that he that he misses out on information, right? Because he doesn't want to listen to the tapes that pass back and forth between his wife. He has no idea what his wife and Robert have said about him previously, right? The one the one time he was given a chance to listen. He just says, we were interrupted, and then he never goes back and finishes the tape, almost as though he doesn't want to know what they're going to say about him. So the narrator goes through his daily life, goes through the world with incomplete information about everything. And he's aware of this, and it causes him anxiety, but he doesn't seem to know what to do about it. He doesn't seem to understand what to do with that. So uh, let's take a look for a moment. Just let me log back into this so I can see what time it is because there's no working clock in this room. Let's take a moment and go to the scene in which they're trying to uh, figure out the concept of a cathedral. If we look on page uh, 43 here, They're watching the TV, they're listening to the TV. We didn't say anything for a time. He was leaning forward with his head turned at me, his right ear aimed in the direction of the set. Very disconcerting. Now and then his eyelids drooped and they snapped open again. Now and then he put his fingers into his beard and tugged like he was thinking about something he was hearing on the television. On the screen, a group of men wearing cowls was being set upon and tormented by men dressed in skeleton costumes and men dressed as devils. 
The men dressed as devils wore devil masks, horns, and long tails. The pageant was part of a procession. The Englishman who was narrating the thing said it took place in Spain once a year. I tried to explain to the blind man what was happening. Skeletons, he said. I know about skeletons, he said, and he nodded. The TV showed this one cathedral. Then there was this long, slow look at another one. Finally, the picture switched to the famous one in Paris, with its flying buttresses and its spires reaching up to the clouds. The camera pulled away to show the whole of the cathedral rising above the skyline. There were times when the Englishman who was telling the thing would shut up, would simply let the camera move around, move around over the cathedrals, or else the camera would tour the countryside, men in fields walking behind oxen. I waited as long as I could. Then I felt I had to say something. I said, they're showing the outside of this cathedral now. Gargoyles, little statues carved to look like monsters. Now I guess they're in Italy. Yeah, they're in Italy. There's paintings on the walls of this one church. Why does the narrator feel he has to chime in here and explain what's on the television? Yeah. He, so who won't feel alone? And he's saying to the bottom of the alone. That's yeah. why he keeps talking to him so, so he knows he's still there. Yeah, that was the right the thing he said. Like he, he doesn't want Robert to think he's left the room. But Robert knows whether or not he's there. We can tell that Robert's senses are better than that. So every time the TV goes quiet, every time the narrator on the television program stops talking, the narrator starts talking and describes to Robert what? The visual, right? The picture. Because he assumes that that's the only way to share the experience with Robert. Right? The only way I can share this experience with you, the only way I can make a connection with you, is by explaining to you what this thing looks like. It also indicates, I think, you know, a level of discomfort with silence. Right? I, I, I know people who are like this. You can just sort of be, you know, sitting quietly reading, um, you know, quietly doing work. Like, hey, what you doing? Oh, you're working, huh? Wow. Hey, what's that you're working on? It's like, just shut the fuck up and go away. <laughs> but, but they interpret that somehow as hostility. Yeah. Anywho, right? The narrator seems to have that sort of kind of discomfort with silence, right? He can't just sit there quietly with Robert. The guy makes him, the guy still makes him nervous. So he has to talk. Are those fresco painting bubs? He asked and sipped from his drink. I reached for my glass, but it was empty. I tried to remember what it was, what I could remember. You're asking me, are those frescoes? He said, I said, that's a good question. I don't know. The camera moved to a cathedral outside Lisbon. The differences in this Portuguese cathedral compared with the French and Italian were not that great, but they were there, mostly the interior stuff. Then something occurred to me, and I said, something has occurred to me. Do you have any idea what a cathedral is, what they look like, that is? Do you follow me? If somebody says cathedral to you, do you have any notion what they're talking about? Do you know the difference between that and a Baptist church, say? He let the smoke dribble from his mouth. I know they took hundreds of workers 50 or 100 years to build. I just heard the man say that, of course. I know that generations of the same families worked on a cathedral. I heard him say that, too. The men who began their life's work on them, they never lived to see the completion of their work. In that wise, bub, they're no different from the rest of us, right? He laughed. Then his eyelids drooped again. His head nodded. He seemed to be snoozing. Maybe he imagined he was, maybe he was imagining himself in Portugal. The TV was showing another cathedral now. This one was in Germany. The Englishman's voice droned on. Cathedrals, the blind man said. He sat up and rolled his head back and forth. If you want the truth, bub, that's about all I know. What I just said. What I heard him say. But maybe you could describe one to me. I wish you'd do it. I'd like that. If you want to know, I really don't have a good idea. So he has a conceptual historical understanding of what a cathedral is. Like, he knows what people put into them. But what is the important thing that he has learned from watching this special or listening to this special about cathedrals? Who built them? Yeah, members of the same family over generations, right? A cathedral in the Middle Ages was the work of an entire community. Right. 
This was a giant project labored over by hundreds of anonymous workmen. Right? There may be some, you know, architect, you know, one or more architects, probably more, because these things took so long to build, um, overseeing the entire project. But by and large, the whole thing is put together by groups of ordinary people working together. And so in order to help Robert understand what a cathedral is, what does the narrator have to do? But he can't do it, right? Yeah, they have to sit together with the paper and draw it together, right? The narrator draws it, and Robert puts his hand on his and follows. So in order to make the connection, they have to work together using a shared sense. Right? The narrator can't just explain to Robert, this is how it appears. Because to Robert, that still doesn't make a whole, it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He can't see. He can't get the visual. So in order to get a sense of what this thing is, they have to work together using a sense that they both have. So if we want to talk about, like, say, an organizing binary in this particular story, like, you know, so a paired opposition around which the whole thing revolves, what would you say that probably is and why? Pardon? Okay, remember we talked last time about, right, so we use binaries, paired oppositions. Right, so one thing we've been unpacking here is a pattern of emphasis on the visual, right? There's a lot of language that refers to sight, to vision, to the visual, right? So that would be one of those, those strands that we talked about last time. Now, if we want to talk about Right, a binary, a pair of important oppositions. You know, hot, cold, wet, dry, male, female. Where do we see opposites sort of pushing against each other in the story? Okay, yeah. Sight and blindness. Relationship with the wife and the relationship with the wife. Okay, yeah, and how, if we could boil that down to sort of single words, like how would we describe the narrator's relationship with his wife in a single word, for example? Um, Struck it. Yep. Strained, closed. Yeah, closed versus open, right? And closed, we would say, is associated with the sighted person. And openness, we would associate with the blind person here, right? Because the blind person is much more open to other avenues of experience. Yeah. Other oppositions you see at work here. Anything else? Okay, then why don't we try to unpack these oppositions a little bit, right? So oftentimes what you'll see in a story of this type, right, it'll start with one of these sets of oppositions and then kind of work its way around to taking it apart, right, to try to, you know, try to explode that difference, um, to reduce the importance of that difference. So. A lot of what we see here, right, is Robert, the blind man. And did you notice there's a, there's a point at which the narrator, for at least for the beginning of the story, right, the narrator is doing exactly the same thing to Robert that he does when he's talking about his wife's ex, right? He just refers to him always as the blind man, the blind man, the blind man. And then at a certain point, he shifts to calling him by his name. 
He's not the blind anymore. He's, you know, he's Robert. He's not an abstract concept. He is a concrete individual sitting here right in front of me smoking a joint and playing with his beard. So <clears throat> by introducing the narrator to other ways of seeing, to another kind of sensory experience, right? Seeing the world through touch and through another person's senses, really. Yeah, and the whole binary gets reversed, right? That Robert really sees much more of the world than the narrator does. The narrator really only is concerned with his narrow pocket of it and with his conception of what things are and how they're supposed to be. Right? Much of which he you know, sort of covers up with prickly sensitivity. But the other thing that this gives the narrator, right, our closed-minded, closed, you know, closed experience narrator is that human connection that he's been unable to make throughout the rest of the story. Right? Can't connect with his wife, he doesn't have any friends. But Robert, by sitting there with his hand on his as they draw together, is able to make that kind of thing. Even the wife never gets a name, right? The only character in the story, I think this is really important, the only characters in the story who are named are Robert and his dead wife, right? So, this is what, one of those things we can chalk up to. Remember we, call, we talked uh, last time about anomaly, right? Things in the story that are strange, things in the story that don't fit a pattern. All right, so the only characters who are actually named in the story, the only characters who are individualized in that way, right, one of them we never meet. She's dead at the beginning of the story. And the other is the blind man that the narrator initially has so much distaste for. Why do you think these are the only characters who get, a na who get names. Right. What does naming a character do for us? Yeah, it individualizes them, right? It gives you a sense that this is, yeah, this is Okay, look, one thing I'm going to say, like, overall, right, character, we, we all understand, right, characters and stories are not real people, right? They're words on a page. They're collections of ideas expressed by authors. We're not meant to take them as real people. And, in fact, it is often a mistake to take characters in stories as being too close to life, right? If you ever find yourself in writing that you're doing for this class or another class, um, saying that a character should do this or should do that. Remember that you're not talking about real people. You're not talking about anyone whose behavior can be changed. Right? The characters in a story, you will find new things in a story every time you read it, but the characters will always do the same things. They will make the same mistakes. Right? There's nothing you can do to fix that or correct that. So. In general, we should, we, we should not treat them as real people. But Robert and Beulah are individualized in a way that the narrator and his wife are not. Now, on the one hand, right, Robert is unusual. Right, not only in his disability, but also in his range of interests and his sort of general friendliness and open-mindedness, right? Robert is not a normal person. 
Why give Robert's wife a name as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Robert so much too. Pardon? Like her relationship with Robert, like their relationship together, maybe like he wanted that with his wife or something like that. Yeah, this is an example of like actual human closeness and connection, right? Mm -hmm. This was a loving marriage, a loving relationship. This is a sort of example of the kind of connection that even though the narrator puts it down, this is what he really wants with his wife. So Robert and Beulah are individualized because in a way they're kind of set up as an ideal. Now, you know, it's not ideal that she dies of cancer, but nonetheless, they're individualized because they're supposed to be a model. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if we had this too? As opposed to sort of the, the narrator and his wife. I mean, they're, you know, is it easy to get, a, to, to get a fix on where they live? Yeah, not anymore, right? They're on the East Coast. We know it's somewhere on the East Coast. We know it's somewhere that's five hours by train from Connecticut. But that's really kind of as much as the story gives us. It's hard to fix a location. Can we really tell very much about their house? Yeah, the setting's not really all that concrete. What's the only thing we know about the narrator's job? He doesn't want to do it. Yeah. It's, right, that it's, it's, it's shit, but he doesn't feel like he has any other options. But we know this great wealth of detail about Robert, right? We know about all these things he's done. We know about various jobs that he's had, various places that he's lived. We know, some, we know several details even about the narrator's wife's life before she married the narrator. But we know very few details about the narrator himself. And we know very few details about his overall married life, right? So Robert is the character who's really made concrete for us, who's made to look most like a real individual person. I think, again, this is supposed to suggest to us that in a way, Robert is the important guy here. Robert is kind of teaching the narrator how to be human. Or how to be a better human. Or at least a more interesting human. Right? Instead of somebody who just hates his job, falls asleep on the couch every day smoking pot. But hey, you know, if that's your life, I don't judge. All right, so <clears throat> what, I've, what I've been trying to do today, um, I know I've sort of done a lot of talking today, and what I've been trying to do is demonstrate to you how you can pick things out in a story that are strange and try to make meaning out of them, how you can pick out these pairs of oppositions in a story and make meaning out of them, you know, how you can locate these patterns of repetition. Uh, so I'm hoping that when we do... Sonny's Blues a week and a half from now that you've seen how to do this and you'll be picking some of this up, right? Um, we, will, we will be next time doing uh, chapter one of writing analytically and uh, you'll be doing, I think it's assignment three uh, at the end of the chapter. That's going to be uploaded to the appropriate Dropbox in Georgia View. If you don't know where to find the Dropbox, just ask me and I'll show you. Um, but uh, yeah, that'll be due next Wednesday. I won't see you on Monday because federal holiday. So uh, I guess that's all I've got for you. Unless you have any questions, you are free to go. And we'll see you in a week. It's yeah, it's in writing and a little bit. Yeah, you just make an independent Word document and upload it. Yeah, exactly.